this talk is on process view and strategy product or services must meet customer expectations expectations such as physical expectations comfort safety convenience psychological expectations such as relaxation and peace of mind and social and spiritual expectations and they must do so within a budget business processes provide product and services new car financing producing an engine making a hamburger delivering a book from Amazon to customer teaching a course are examples of business processes in this course we learn how do organizations categorize customer expectations how do they develop processes capable to fulfill customer expectations and what metrics are used to measure if they have fulfilled the customer expectations in this course we adopt a process view we look at everything as input process and output input a transformation process and output inputs can be tangible or intangible natural or processed resources parts and components energy data customer cash and so on outputs are tangible or intangible items that flow from the system back into the environment products byproducts energy information served customers cash and so on these are examples of some processes so in a manufacturing process raw material on input among some other things and finished goods are outputs among some other things in an accounting process data is input financial statements are output in a billing process account receivable is input and cash is output in general in a transformation process unsatisfied customer demand is input and satisfied customer demand is output we said we look at everything as a process and a process has five components inputs outputs human and capital resources a network of value added and non-value added activities and an information structure so inputs come to the system and become outputs throughout this process we call them flow unit a flow unit could be an item of input or it could be the output so flow unit could be input could be output could be a combination of these two depends on why we are looking at this process and the process has a set of value added activities and a set of buffers waiting lines these inputs go into the system in the form of flow units and become outputs however in order to run that process in order to run that those activities and buffers we need human and capital resources and we also need a information structure to get feedback from this system and see how things are going in general in a process we show physical flow as solid lines information flow as dotted or dashed lines let's look at a couple of processes and their 
flow units. An order fulfillment process starts from receipt of an order and ends at delivery of product. Flow units are orders here. In an outbound logistic, process starts from the end of production and ends when the product is delivered to the customer and flow units are products. In a supply cycle, flow units are supplies. The system boundaries, the battery limits of the system, starts from issuing a purchase order and ends at receipt of supplies. In a customer service process, customers are flow units. They start from the point when an unsatisfied customer shows up until the point where a satisfied customer leave the system. In a research and development process, flow units are projects. System starts from recognition of a need and ends at launching the project. In a cash cycle process, flow units is cash. The system boundaries, the battery limits of the system start from the point that we have an expenditure until the point when we collect our revenue regarding the product or services that this expenditure went through. So this expenditure went to a product or a service. We did the transformation process, we send it to the customer, and now we collect the revenue from the customer. And that is from point that we put cash into the system until the point that we collect cash from the system. In this course, we look at everything as a system. And a system is defined by its components. The relationship between those components and the objective, the goal of existence of this system. We also define the boundary limits of the system. That is the boundary where out of that is environment and inside of it is our system. Usually we do have control on variables and parameters inside the battery limit but we don't have that much control on variables and parameters out of the system that is why we call the variable and parameters here endogenous and variable and parameters over there exogenous so we have a system and everything else which is not inside the system is indeed environment a system is defined by its components, interrelationship between those components, and the objective of the system. How systems can grow? Systems can grow by increasing the number of their components. This system is preferred to this system because it has one additional component. Or they can grow by increasing, by enhancing the relationship between components. This system is preferred to this system because it has more integrated relationship between its components. It can perform much better in a complex environment. It can benefit from synergy between the components. The whole system performs better than some of its components. In systems theory, we say 2 is greater than 1 and 1 
because of that plus relationship between one and one. Of course, this is not mathematically true, but that is what we say in systems theory. In systems approach, we should think about what is at benefit of the total system, not what is at benefit of components of a system. Performance measures of subsystems must be linked to the performance measure of the total system. Let me give you an example. Suppose demand is cyclic. This is time, horizontal axis is time, and vertical axis is demand. Here demand is low and it goes up. Of course, marketing department wants to have this much product here, this much product here, this much here, this much here, this much here, this much here. For marketing, Availability of product should follow this curve. But purchasing does not want to buy raw material at these points because at these points demand for final product is high and therefore the price of the raw material, the price of the components and input for this product is high because demand for the product is high. Purchasing department wants to purchase here. Therefore, marketing department prefers this pattern while purchasing department wants to buy like this. Two contradictory view towards what is the benefit. This is the benefit for purchasing department because they will be evaluated based on the price that they have paid for the product and marketing department will be evaluated based on availability of the product. Production department does not want to follow neither this pattern nor this pattern because in both of those cases production should hire and fire people. Production likes to produce smoothly at the same level. So for production, the best issue is to produce at this level, but because demand is less, so we will have some inventory here, and then that inventory can be consumed over. Three components of a system, marketing, purchasing, and manufacturing, three different type of defining what is the benefit, what is at the benefit of that subsystem. We shouldn't look at those subsystems. We should look and see what is at the benefit of the total system, which may be one of these three curves or maybe a combination of them. Let me give you a second example. Suppose we have two sequential stations input comes here at this department it becomes this product and at this work center or department it becomes final product and will leave the system suppose last year production as this work center was 100 and production of this work center was 100 and we produced 100 units of product. This year production of this work center is 200. 100% improvement. Should we reward them? We don't know. We need to look and see what is the production here. If here the production is 80 and then total systems had a 80 units of production. We have not improved the situation, but our performance is 80% of last year. No one should be rewarded. No reward for anyone because performance of all subsystems should be linked to the performance of the total system.
we should avoid sub-optimization. Sub-optimization means we focus on improvement of subsystems which do not have impact on improvement of the performance of the total system. Again, performance measure of subsystems must be linked to the performance measure of the total system. Customers define the attribute of the products in a four-dimensional space of price of the product, the time that it will take to get that product, variety that is available to them, and quality of the product. These are attributes that are defined by our customers, and they are external. Our production managers should develop process competencies to match those product attributes, and these are internal. The competencies that we are developing are cost. We want our processes to have low cost to be able to deliver low price to customers. We want the flow time to be low, to be able to quickly respond to the customer demand. We want our processes to be flexible, to be able to deliver a variety of products to our customers. And we like to have a process which has a high quality to be able to produce high quality products or services. Product attributes which are external components and are defined by customers are product price. How much price the customer is willing to pay for this product? Purchase price, cost of service, cost of maintenance, repair, insurance, disposal, all other costs which define the product price and we refer to it as total cost of ownership. How much a customer is willing to pay the total cost of ownership to have our product. The second dimension of product attributes is delivery time. From the time that customer orders the product or register for the service until it actually gets that product or uh, service. Is the product on the shelf? He can immediately take it. Is it in a distribution center or somewhere along the production line? Response time is important for customers, but beside average response time, what is important is reliability in response time, the standard deviation of response time. If someone is going to deliver a product to you in two days, but it may go from half a day to say 30 days, you will not be happy with such a response time because it may take 30 days. If you go to Federal Express and they say, oh, we deliver 95% of our packages within 24 hours, but some of them it may take up to 60 days to deliver them. You never go and give your package to a company like this. So beside the average response time, what is also important is reliability in the response time, and that means response time should have low standard deviation. Then we have product variety. Customers may be happy with one single uh, model, one single option, if, for example, it is always available and if the price is very low. But beside that specific market segment, other customers want some sort of variety. A variety can be defined in a level that, oh, you have Mustang and then you have different type of Mustang, different 
models and colors and style of a specific product or a company may offer different product lines and product families and finally customers define one di other dimension of the product as quality the degree of excellence how well the product works features what it can do performance how well it functions reliability serviceability aesthetics conformance to expectation we said reliability in response time means low standard deviation in the response time we also define reliability with respect to quality and that is consistent quality quality over time a product and a service which is good and remains good over time customers define product attributes in four dimensional space of price quality response time and variety companies can develop a customer value proposition to fulfill the expectations you have in the four dimensional space of price variety response time and quality products have two classes of characteristics order qualifiers are characteristics of a product which convince the customer to think about that product and then we have order winners order winners are characteristics beyond order qualifiers order winners convince the customer to buy the product and this is different for different market segments order qualifiers for a walmart customer and order winners for a walmart customer are entirely different than order qualifiers and order winners for a whole food market customer order qualifiers in the eyes of commercial airlines who they want to buy a plane are entirely different than those order qualifiers and order winners in the eye of a wealthy businessman who wants to buy a private jet in many industries order winners over time become order qualifiers customers purchase based on the value that they derive from a product that value is the greatest amount that a customer is willing to pay if this value is greater than the price that we offer to the customer they will buy it otherwise they don't if several products several companies propose their products with different prices and the customers view different values in these different products then the customer will buy the product which has the maximum gap between the value that he or she derives compared to the price that the manufacturer or service provider offers and we refer to the difference between that value which is in the eye of the customer and that price which is the market price of the product as consumer surplus zara is a well known name in apparel industry zara's business is design manufacture distribution and retailing zara differentiate itself from its competitors by timely fashion for the masses customer value proposition of zara is timely yet limited variety at modest cost and quality so it looks for a market segment which is willing to buy timely fashion it is not so anxious about the variety the price should be average and they expect average quality customers define in four dimensional space of the price they are willing to pay the quality they expect to get 
the time that it takes to get the product and the variety of options they do have. So product is defined in this four dimensional space by the customers. Firms define their customer value proposition to meet and exceed those expectations in order to be able to deliver that customer value proposition firms should create process competencies in four dimensional space of cost quality time and flexibility they should produce low cost products to satisfy the customer expectation in price dimension in the quality dimension time dimension and flexibility to match that variety we need to have process competencies in these four dimensions to reflect that customer value proposition in a product that meets and exceeds customer expectations the first dimension is cost dimension that is the total cost of producing and delivering the products the outputs we need to look at the process look at the production process and find it out what portions of this production process are value adding are transferring the product from its original form to its final form and what parts are non-value adding they do not play a role in the transformation process transformation process of producing a product or delivering a service we need to remove non-value added portions of the production process to be able to reduce the production cost we need to allocate appropriate resource to each activity if resource is better than activity, activity cost goes up. If resource is lower than activity, quality of process goes down, quality of product goes down. Therefore, we need to find exactly the appropriate resource. We need to have high standardization and we need to have low variations in arrival time and low variation in processing time. And the last but not least, we need to have high utilization. We need to fully utilize our human and capital resources in order to break down their cost on a larger number of products. Let's take a look at this Ford Motors video. What Ford did, he really broke the barriers of poverty as long as it's related to the capabilities of production processes. And he brought many products which were in the hands of elites to the hands of average people. In those days, competition was mainly defined in one dimensional space of the cost and price of the product. Because many products due to their high prices were not available to uh, average people therefore if you could reduce the production cost you could make it available for a large number of people and you could benefit from that huge market hi this is kelly from car data video today we're going to have a history lesson of all the automobiles that have ever been designed and built in the world, there's one that stands out as most significant above them all, and that's the Model T Ford. The Model T introduced mass production and single-handedly brought us from a horse and buggy level of technology to one where we had machines that were run by gasoline engines. Using a moving assembly line, Henry Ford was able to build these things in about one-tenth the time it took to build uh, other vehicles by hand previous to the Model T. The Model T's were simple, they were rugged, 
they were cheap and as Henry Ford used to say you can have any color you want as long as it's black. When they were first introduced in 1909 they sold for $950 which doesn't sound like much to us today. Back then that was quite a lot of money. Henry Ford cleverly paid his employees $5 a day which back then was a huge amount of money compared to other jobs that they could get. He also reduced their work day from 9 to 8 hours but again by doing that he could have three production shifts working and hence build cars around the clock. All of this was going on at a time of uh, economic difficulty and transition and so the result of this is people would come from all over the country to get jobs working in Detroit at the auto factories and of course their job of choice was with Ford. Production of the Model A's went for 19 years from 1908 to 1928 and uh, the last ones that were built they weren't very much different from the very first ones that he originally produced. They had wooden spoked wheels with metal rims pressed on them. You can see here what they're doing is hand uh, filing the spokes uh, to make them smooth so they can be painted. The assembly line was split so that the frame and the wheels and tires and everything were assembled at one point and then the bodies were assembled separately and then at one point the body would be dropped onto the frame. Eventually the Model T was replaced by a Model A which was a modernized, stylized version of a vehicle that looked quite the same. Highland Park was the first modern assembly plant and it's where the Model T's were produced and uh, just like today when they're done being assembled they're driven off the assembly line. Finally after 19 years of production Henry Ford had actually built almost 15 and a half million Model T's and uh, they were by far the most popular and most plentiful vehicle on the road and here you can see the assembly of the 15 millionth which is a four-door convertible model and as you can see they've added some paint colors other than just black and that actually is Henry Ford there uh, driving off the assembly line and uh, driving in that uh, 15 millionth Model T Ford. This particular one hadn't gone through final assembly quality control. You can see how Henry had to give a little uh, nudge there to get it shut properly. Many companies have followed Ford Motors philosophy of production line. For example, Shudis Hospital in Canada as focused on hernia operations only. Standardized repeatable outpatient surgical procedures at very high quality and very low price are done there. They have minimized variability by not accepting patients with risk factors such as blood pressure and so on. They have produced a production line in where the required hernia operations is done at a very high quality and very low price. Another example is Aravind Hospital in India. People of India are vulnerable to cataracts. Millions go blind at their 50s because they cannot afford uh, surgeries. Aravind Eye Hospital started by treating pain patients and using the profit to offer free care to the poor. But some people still they could not afford to come to the city, pay for transportation, and also they needed someone to be with them to support these patients. They created their own bus system and their own assistants, which go to the villages and pick up those people and bring them to the hospital to keep costs low. Surgical equipment is used all the day and they allocate to each activity they allocate the appropriate resource. Doctors focus only on performing surgeries. Pre and post operative care is all handled by nurses. Aravin served two and a half million outpatients and performed 300,000 cataract surgeries in less than one year. Despite providing two-thirds of the outpatient visits and three-quarters of the surgeries as free services to the poor, Aravind generated healthy profit to found its growth. The key concept in lowering production cost is to allocate appropriate resources to each operation. Appropriate means not lower than what is needed, not higher than what is needed. Higher than what is needed increases the cost, lower than what is needed reduces the quality.
Then we need to reduce variability in quality, reduce variability in arrival of patients, reduce variability in operations. Those are all other elements of low cost. Then as I discussed, we need to increase utilization of all human and capital resources to close to 100%. And reduction in variability allows that increase in utilization because as we will see later, in the presence of variability, we can never reach 100% utilization or even close to 100% utilization. Standardization, reducing variability, high utilization, and allocating appropriate resources to each activity are key components of cost reduction. Cataract surgery at Arawind, hernia surgery at Shuris are examples of implementing Ford production line in healthcare. In Ford production line, you design a huge machine targeted towards producing a specific product with the narrow variations at the minimal possible cost. Cataract surgery at Ravind, hernia surgery at Shudis, are examples of implementing Ford production line in healthcare. Ford production line was a huge machine targeted towards production of a specific product with no or very small variations. And in that era, competition was defined mainly in one dimensional space of cost. Then competition went to two dimensions. General Motors came into the auto market of the United States. They brought the second dimension of variety. And to deliver variety, you need flexibility. So the second process competencies that we need is flexibility. The ability to produce and deliver a variety of product at high as well as low volume. In Ford production system, you could produce extremely low cost products with minimal variability, both in the type of the product and also in the volume of production. If volume of production were going down in production line of Ford, production cost was going sharply up because a huge fixed cost should have been broken on a small number of products. The key concept in flexible systems is you can produce at high volume as well as low volume at a reasonable cost. In order to be able to create flexibility inside a production system, you need cross-trained workers to be able to shift from one operation to another. General purpose equipment, equipment which can produce different types of product. Theoretically, we can say all machines are general purpose, but in order to transform them from producing one product to the other, we may need to spend infinite time or infinite financial resources. A flexible machine has a short set of time. In US auto industries, in 60s, if you wanted to go from producing one product to, to another, you should have stopped your production system for one week. Japanese now go from one product to another in 30 minutes, 20 minutes. Key components for flexibility are cross-trained workers, short setup time, which means more general purpose machines, delayed differentiation. Delayed differentiation means you postpone the differences that you make in your product to the latest steps. An excellent example of delayed differentiation is when you go to buy paint in Home Depot. They offer you hundreds and hundreds of products, different colors, a spectrum of colors. 
but if they wanted to have all those colors on their shelves the whole home depot should have been assigned to painting department but they only have few base colors and then whatever you want they make it for you they have delayed differentiation to the last step for flexibility we need a job shop and u-shaped layout i will discuss it later and we need small batch size small batch size means each time we produce a small number of products we don't produce a product for six months of demand because during that six months customers may change their preferences they may don't want that product anymore. on the other hand new technology may come and if i have already produced six months of product it takes me at least six months to implement that technology therefore flexible systems are more responsive both to changes in customer preferences and also in changes in technologies in 70s japanese auto industry added one new dimension to the process competencies it was due to the high quality of their product which they were able to take away a large portion of um, world's auto market from u.s industries and also u.s auto market from u.s auto industries process quality means the ability to produce and deliver high quality products quality at source you produce and you check at the same minute if there is a problem you stop the production line effective design as well as production that confirms to design and fourth dimension of process competencies is process flow time the total time to transform a flow unit from input into output and to deliver it to the customer effective layout and smooth material flow are main components of a short flow time less variability in arrival rate processing rate and quality or other requirements of smooth flow time no starvation no blockage starvation means one station is waiting for the output of the previous station blockage is the next station does not have space to get the output of the previous station still is not done with the previous batch or previous batches smooth flow means no defect and no rework if i am forced to define operations management in one short single line i will say operations management is to create a smooth flow smooth flow means low production cost because the flow units should come into the processes and leave quickly they do not have time to collect costs smooth flow means high quality because as soon as we observe quality problems we have to stop the production line a stop production line doesn't have smooth flow so we can only have smooth flow if we are producing high quality products smooth flow means a flexible system because we do not have too much inventor and we can easily respond to technological advances and changes in customer preferences and switch from one product to another all we say uh, is correct for production systems and for service systems such as distribution systems healthcare systems entertainment systems and so on and so forth corolla has flow shop the centralized assembly plant close to market 
short flow time low cost ferrari has job shop only a single plant in italy long flow time high cost which one is a better company we really don't know it depends on the strategy and the market segment that they have focused on if they are synchronized with those elements they are successful otherwise they are not mcmaster care is a material repair and operations and what they usually call it mro product distributor a process with high flexibility high quality short response time but high price whatever they provide for you you can buy it in the market at a lower cost but in a longer time or perhaps not at the quality they provide walmart its operational strategy is short flow time low inventory its operation structure is cross docking cross docking means for example two trucks come one has red products and one has blue products and they go in a warehouse which is nothing but a little bit conveyor system and carts and then there will be two other trunks which carry red and blue red and blue product and they go to the Walmart stores so a truck with red product comes a truck with blue product comes from suppliers in a place with minimal storage using material handling systems these two products are put into two trucks which now carry uh, both the blue and uh, red products and they uh, go to the corresponding Walmart stores. They have electronic data exchange, a fast transportation system, focused locations which has enough market and communication between the stores such that if inventory of product in one store is high and in another store is low, they can transfer uh, product between these two stores. Inventory turns, the times that inventory turns throughout the year in Walmart is almost one and a half times of the target. And sales per square foot in Walmart is more than $400 and in target is less than $300 per square feet. I said if people ask me that in one short line define operations management, I will say operation management should create a smooth flow in a hospital, in a university, in a bank, in a production system, in an assembly line, in a distribution system. That is what operations management should do. Operations management structure the process competencies in the direction of the customer value proposition. It develops measures to evaluate the effectiveness and efficiency of the processes. So operations management develops process competencies to meet with customer value proposition. It develops measures to evaluate effectiveness of these processes and efficiency of these processes. I will go through effectiveness and efficiency later and operations management applies methods and techniques to improve process performance. Process competencies are controllable. Product attributes which are defined by customers are not controllable, are not controllable by us. Remember we said in a system view, we look at the system, that's what we have control on it process competencies and the environment, the customer preferences. Customer preferences defines the product attributes and we need to prepare a customer value proposition which meets and exceeds product attributes 
and then we need to develop process competencies to be able to deliver that customer value proposition. And that's process competencies which are controllable, which we have control on them. We don't have control on product attributes. There are three performance measures which help us to understand if the process competencies are the best fit for the product attributes. Financial performance measures, external performance measures, and internal performance measures. 